the project I'm presenting today is titled Capitalizing on the Urban Deathscape, Financialization in Post-Crisis Contexts. And essentially, I look to understand the changing relationship between the finance and the development sectors and the state in the post-crisis context of Ireland and Spain. Uh, so at the halfway stage, uh, firstly, let me just thank Neil for arranging today's symposium and obviously to the Foundation for Funding Support over the last year and a half. I'll begin with some uh, introductory comments about the nature of the financial crisis, uh, and then I'll discuss some of the theories and concepts guiding the project. Uh, I'll then discuss uh, research aims and methods before zeroing in on one particular aspect of the empirical findings, which forms the basis of my first paper uh, on real estate investment trusts in Ireland. Uh, and I'll conclude with some um, uh, discussion of, of achievements over the time and some future plans. So introducing the debtscape. Well, since 2007, we know that finance and real estate have been deeply implicated in driving property market crashes uh, across advanced economies that have led to the longest post-war economic recession. Uh, this was triggered by the collapse of the US subprime market, but also rising mortgage default and foreclosure rates across peripheral Europe, uh, which in themselves led into uh, wider systemic banking crises, as well as sovereign debt crises. To manage these outcomes, the state itself has become a major finance and development actor through, for example, uh, uh, bank nationalizations and recapitalizations, the establishment of bad banks to absorb toxic real estate debt, as well as the rollout of new um, financial instruments and technologies and fiscal incentives to the finance and development sectors. For Harvey, the crisis is rooted in the increasingly global nature of real estate investment and the empowerment of finance capital, which in themselves have stimulated uh, property bubbles um, by switching capital from the productive economy to uh, speculative investments in real estate. Uh, in this vein, uh, a growing body of work has considered uh, financialization as both a cause and consequence of the crash. And financialization broadly describes how finance and financial markets and actors have come to occupy an increasingly dominant position in contemporary society and examines the processes and effects of the growing power of uh, financial values uh, and, and technologies on states, firms, and households. Much of this literature has examined the impacts of the wall of money that was pumped into global real estate over the last two decades, which as the graph up top will show you, increased from about $4 trillion globally in 1997 to about $12 trillion by 2007. Now, looking at the impacts of this, uh, this is kind of evident in what Walks has termed the urban debtscape, or the socio-spatial outcomes arising from the breakdown in the circuits that connect global financial markets and local uh, real estate markets or the built environment. And this debtscape is evident in the avalanche of distressed development assets and debts uh, that have accompanied um, the collapse of property markets, as I said, across advanced economies. But it's also evident in the patterns of mortgage defaults and foreclosures, both across subprime America, as, as you'll see on, the, on the, the bottom map, it's just a kind of a, a hotspot map of foreclosures, and across peripheral Europe. Now, the scale of this debtscape is staggering. European banks currently hold about 879 billion euro in non-performing loans, the majority of which relate to real estate. Across the US, about 6.2 million homes have been foreclosed upon since 2007, uh, often with these homes being sold back to private equity investors at considerable discounts as they seek to capitalize on the uplift in values. Now, despite the, the, the emergence of all of this work on the causes and consequences of the crash, Albers contends that we still, knowledge is still underdeveloped regarding the connections between the finance and the real estate sectors and the state. And this is particularly so in post-crisis contexts where we're kind of unclear how the relationship between these spheres of the political economy are changing, uh, or indeed how they're acting to resolve the crisis broadly in their interests. There are many questions to be asked. You know, it's unclear how the link between finance and the built environment is being re-established post-crash. How are distressed real estate assets being redeployed back into financial circuits? What role is the state playing in rebooting the real estate financial complex? And what are the implications of this um, for existing uh, political economy? So theories and concepts, as I've said, financialization is understood as, a, as a, a, a regime of accumulation where profit occurs through financial channels rather than through trade and commodity production. Uh, and it's been understood from three dominant approaches. Uh, the first of these, the regime of accumulation, uh, which really draws on political economy perspectives, considers the rise of a finance-led regime of growth from the 1960s in response to the declining profitability of manufacturing, 
uh, and how credit and, and finance are being used to compensate for falling incomes or stagnating incomes to drive uh, effective demand and continued capital expansion. A second approach comes from critical social accountancy, and this considers the rise of shareholder value as uh, shareholder value is the guiding principle for the implementation of policies and practices that prioritize shareholder interests over those of other corporate constituents and considers the implications of this redistribution of corporate wealth and power. The third approach coming from cultural economy approaches considers the financialization of everyday life or how uh, welfare services previously provided by the state are increasingly provided by financial markets. Now, each of these perspectives addresses a different geographic scale. You know, the, uh, the, the nation state, uh, the corporate level, the household or the individual. But when geography is discussed from these perspectives, it's often presented as an empirical you know, kind of frame upon which these processes play out. And this has led a number of economic geographers to make the case more recently for a more overt geographic understanding of financialization, one that takes seriously the constitutive roles of, of space and place in driving these processes. And for French et al, we need to understand financialization as a profoundly spatial phenomenon that represents a new stage in the search for the, 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 the fix to capitalism's crisis tendencies. Now, building on this work, Albers, uh, drawing on, on Harvey's uh, circuits of capital theory, has proposed that financialization represents a quaternary circuit of capital, one where capital not flo doesn't flow to facilitate trade or, or consumption, but purely to, to facilitate the expansion of finance in its own right. And this is you know, the trade in credit, money, derivatives, etc. But Albers goes further and makes the point that this, that this circuit of, of finance capital that's circling, circling at, at this kind of global level is increasingly tied to investments in the built environment and to capital flowing in, in Harvey's secondary circuit of accumulation. So, so this increasing entanglement between global finance and local real estate has unleashed this kind of pool of, of, of yield-seeking financial capital looking for investment in the built environment. And this has occurred through a whole range of innovations, uh, financial innovations and deregulation, but also the, the, the aggregation and sale of very large urban investment portfolios to, to transnational corporations, the creation of new investment techniques like securitization, which funnel or, or, or create credit or funnel credit going into the, into the built environment, uh, the expansion of, of, of financial actors into non-financial markets, for example, private equity firms buying up um, subsidized rental housing in, in New York is, is a good example, or even uh, non-financial firms and public bodies becoming increasingly embroiled in financial markets. The UK's housing association se sector is a good example here as, as it's increasingly reliant on bond markets rather than, than central government for its funding, as well as new forms of of uh, techno-fiscal urban governance in response to austerity conditions. Now, the financialization literature has not been without criticism. Christopher has, has recently argued that we need to be quite careful in using financialization both as a concept, because, you know, it's limited as a concept, he suggests, in that it repackages existing theories like Harvey's that, that don't require repackaging, uh, and as a process in that it's, it's limited by a whole series of analytic, analytic strategic, and empiric uh, limitations. The point that he's getting at is uh, he laments that, that research uh, has thus far mine, you know, examined the effects of finance, i.e. what I've been talking about. This, the, you know, the, there's a lot of papers looking at the, the socioeconomic kind of profiles of those that have, have lost their homes, let's say, in the US or, or across the UK. But we still don't really fully understand the operational infrastructures that support financialization in practice. We've rather ignored the study of finance per se and this is picked up on by, by Puvi and Uma as well. They suggest that, like I said, these operational infrastructures that give rise to financialization, uh, the kind of institutional networks, the legal frameworks, econometric modeling approaches, even financial rationales and theories, these tend to be relegated to a black box. And, and if we were to really understand how these processes work, we need to, we need to crack this black box. Furthermore, Savini and Albers suggest that we need more fine-grained scrutiny of financialization processes at the city level, and particularly regarding land and, and urban development, while Peck has suggested that we need to understand the politics that supports financialization in greater detail. So I think what's been called for is better understanding of how finance and development actors or elites 
derives their power and influence, how this influence then is the mechanisms by which they exert this influence in the political sphere, and then how this influence is then manifested in the built environment. And my project seeks to get at this by looking at the microdynamics involved in the re-regulation of the finance and development sectors post-crash to understand how they, they are picking off the carcass of this property crash, um, like I said, in the cases of Ireland and Spain. So aims and methods. The project is operationalized through three interrelated work packages that address different questions. The first of these is the financialization of real estate and considers how uh, financial and development sector elites are reshaping property markets in crisis hit countries and what the implications are uh, for the local uh, political economy. So recent years have seen the massive expansion of global real estate investment companies into devalued markets like Ireland and Spain, where they're buying up um, you know, thousands of, of devalued properties, distressed property assets and debt, often at, you know, for, for, for pennies on the pound or cents on the dollar. Um, and so this work package tries to consider what the motivations and the strategies of these investors are, the scale of their investment, investments, how they're interacting with the established legal, political, and development sectors, and then what the implications are for those markets. The second work package is the financialization of urban governance and considers how existing organizational, institutional, legal, and cultural contexts are being reconfigured to facilitate further financialization. The development of financial techniques like securitization do not occur in a vacuum and in fact require substantial state support to create the necessary institutional, legal frameworks, etc., to support them. So this work package tries to look at issues like uh, regulatory capture, um, uh, the operation of entrenched interests, uh, to understand really how, how these kind of institutional legal frameworks, etc., are being reconfigured uh, post-crash. The third work package, Calculative Practices and Planning, considers how the, uh, the financialized rationales and modeling approaches are being embedded to shape urban planning policy in, in order to, f to, to, to facilitate finance and, and development interests. So it considers the adoption of, of financial rationales and, and narratives um, and, and how these are kind of incorporated or, or the state is co-opted into incorporating these into its, its urban planning policy and what this means for, for the post-crisis planning, urban planning system. Like I've said, the case studies are Ireland and Spain for kind of obvious reasons. Both have experienced major finance-led property market uh, crashes, or bubbles and crashes that were basically created by the internationalization of their banking sectors, which led to huge credit expansion into their respective markets. And this was facilitated by a whole host of financial innovations as well as the state's procyclical fiscal policies. The severity of the, cash in the crash in these countries is also similar. Both countries' banking systems and, and construction sectors were wiped out. Um, in terms of the impacts on markets, you know, house prices for one fell by well over 50% in both markets. They had huge housing vacancy rates, as well as particularly severe mortgage default and foreclosure crises. But the state's responses have also been largely similar, involved in major bank bailouts uh, of their systems and recapitalizations, but also, crucially, the establishment of two bad banks, Nama and Sareb, uh, who are basically the largest sellers of, of distressed real estate across Europe for certainly the last three years. Uh, they acquired about 180 billion euro of private, ta private debt uh, onto public balance sheets. But also in both, in both cases, the state has been particularly active in rolling out new investment mechanisms like real estate investment trusts, as well as new fiscal incentives to the respective uh, banking and development sectors. In terms of methodology, I largely adopt a qualitative research approach for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, firstly, um, the research questions are, are fairly exploratory in nature, so I think this is better suited to a more qualitative approach, but also getting accurate, disaggregated, quantitative data on the finance and, and real estate sectors, particularly at a city level, is, is really difficult. Um, and it's usually, like I said, quite aggregated. Um, but also to get into, because of the opacity of the finance and development sectors, you kind of really need to get into close dialogue with, with kind of key stakeholders from these sectors to really understand their, their motivations and strategies. But I supplement this work with with fairly extensive policy analysis as well as analysis of, of secondary materials like court re reports and the like. 
My aim is to produce uh, 60, around 60 in-depth semi-structured interviews and I've completed about 35 thus far and these have been transcribed as well. Uh, and these have been conducted with members of real estate investment trusts, uh, large developers, uh, agents from the respective, uh, or from the, the bad banks and the banking sector, uh, real estate consultants and lobbyists, as well as people from the financial side, like uh, financial advisors, wealth managers, people from the legal and tax side, as well as policymakers and politicians. And my interviews have touched on a range of themes, such as state market relationships post-crash, relations between the finance and development sectors, uh, factors shaping the state's crisis response, as well as the changing legal tax uh, and regulatory environments, the adoption of new funding approaches for development, uh, like REITs, uh, as well as the emergence, as I said, of these new real estate actors and their investment strategies. So turning very briefly, this, this, this uh, part of the empirical results comes from um, what will form the basis for my first paper out of the, out of the fellowship work. Um, and it looks at the introduction of real estate investment trusts in Ireland as, as a means of, uh, w w as part of wider efforts, I suppose, to deleverage the country's kind of failed banking system, but also to attract capital into its property market. Now, REITs are, li they're listed real estate investment companies, which means they're, they, they're listed on stock exchanges. Essentially, what they do is they take a portfolio of property assets, they issue shares on these assets, and then they sell them to uh, global shareholders, um, like you'll see kind of up the top. This is just kind of a working frame for them, for, the, for, for explaining the process. Uh, they take the shareholder capital and they acquire more properties or they redevelop the existing buildings that they have and they let these, they let these buildings out to, out to tenants for rents. And they return these rents back to shareholders in the form of annual dividend payments. Okay, so it really ties kind of the, they really sit at the nexus between financial markets, global financial markets, local real estate markets. Now the shareholders also benefit from the appreciation in the in the in the REIT's share value. So as the value of the REIT's properties increase, so does the, the share value of the REIT itself. And then investors can sell off those those shares on, on stock exchanges as well. So they benefit in two ways: capital appreciation through shares and the rental income from, from, from the properties. Now, REITs were developed in the US in the 1960s, but it was only following the Asian financial crisis that we saw a massive expansion in REIT regimes when they were set up in places like Japan and Hong Kong. But more recently, there's been a wave of establishing these REIT systems in Europe, and particularly in Ireland and Spain. Now, most REIT research comes from the areas of urban economics or real estate finance and tends to look at issues like investment performance, management efficiency, that kind of thing. But nobody's really looked at how REIT systems come to be formed or, or how geography, history, politics kind of shapes their development. But there's a number of interesting geographic kind of consider, you know, aspects to REITs. As I've said, they, they spread investor risk over diverse property investments. What they mean is, is that global investors can kind of acquire bite-sized chunks in property all around the world through share ownership without actually having to purchase or having to own the underlying assets themselves. You essentially just own paper shares you know, based on the underlying value of the property. As I said, they distribute rents back to investors as well, so they kind of strengthen that, that kind of connection, that flow of capital between the, the, the global and the local, the financial and the, and, the, and the real estate. But they also disembed the process of investment from the procuring of local knowledge necessary to assess risk. So they contribute to the financial fluidity of property, basically. And this is really what REITs do. They overcome the spatial fixity of property by kind of unlocking value in it, by transforming it into a, into a financial commodity, into shares, which are then, as I said, traded by these kind of disconnected investors. Now, understanding the state's kind of setup of REITs in Ireland as I said, the state's primary response to the property crash was to establish NAMA. NAMA acquired 11,000 loans, which were attached to 60,000 properties, uh, with an original value of about 74 billion euro. But this was transferred into NAMA for about 32 billion euro. That was the sum. NAMA issued bonds, publicly backed bonds. Um, now, this figure actually represented about 15% more than what the market value of these assets were at the time. So the state was actively trying to enhance property values from the get-go in 2009, trying to create an artificial floor under prices. 
Now, NAMA has taken all of these loans and it's been engaged in very rapid, basically, fire sales of these assets. You know, this is taxpayer subsidized fire sales of assets back to major global uh, financial investors, vulture funds, hedge funds, and the like. The devaluation created in Irish property and the concentration of assets in NAMA led to the establishment of what's been called the Irish REITs Forum, which was a, a group of about 11 corporate entities from finance and the real estate sectors that basically lobbied the government into setting up a REIT regime in Ireland. And the, the, the state were kind of happy to do so to enable NAMA to deleverage itself as it, of its assets. And it was introduced in the Finance Act in 2013. And it introduced a whole range of fiscal incentives for REITs. They basically pay very little tax kind of on their on on their assets and their investors while their investors pay tax on their on the profits they generate from 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 the income from rents there's all sorts of workarounds to to, to minimize those tax exposures now three REITs have been established since 2013 green hibernia and ires they've raised about 2.23 billion euro in shareholder capital and debt and they've basically gone out on a spending spree acquiring a whole range of of assets from nama and and the the deleveraging banks now, the investors in REITs are not mom and pop investors with 10 or 20 grand looking to kind of supplement their pension. They are major global financial funds. George Soros's fund was an early investor in Hibernia REIT, uh, run by this man, Kevin Nolan, uh, one of the founders of the REIT Forum. Uh, Paulson & Co., um, the, the New York-based kind of, uh, their 19 billion euro hedge fund were early investors in, in, green, in green REIT as well. And again, they, they're, they're pumping, you're talking tens of millions of euro pumped into, into these companies. And again, they benefit through the capital uplift as the property values of the REITs assets rise, so does, so does the share value of the, of the REITs, in some cases by about 70%. And the investors can then sell these off, you know, like I said, by doing virtually nothing other than owning the shares. Um, they sell these off for a profit, but they also accrue rental dividends, which again, you're talking tens of millions of euro in, in every year. So what have the REITs bought? They've bought about 4.7 million square foot of commercial uh, space, 286 de uh, acres of development land, and about 2,500 apartment units. And all of their assets have been largely uh, concentrated uh, in Dublin, in particularly high-profile sites like the Dublin Docklands and the St. Stephen's Green area, but also a couple of suburban growth nodes kind of on just in the, 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 the southern suburbs. <laughs> Uh, again, much of these assets have come from NAMA and the deleveraging banks at huge debt write-downs. Uh, just to give you two examples, uh, this one here down at the bottom, Central Park, is a 700,000 square foot commercial development out in uh, uh, Sandyford, out in South Dublin. Uh, this was acquired by uh, a consortium led by Green Reef, um, and we, we, the best estimates of this property is it's probably cost the Irish taxpayer in the region of about three to 400 million euro from the sale of this asset. But in, in the three years since this asset has been bought, its value has increased by about 50%. In the case of Camac Crescent here up in, in, in Inchi Cord, this was acquired by IRES from NAMA in, a, in 2014 for 9.9 .9 million euro. Two years later, it was valued at 17.9 million euro, an uplift of about 80% in just two years. So not only does this call into question NAMA's sales process and whether it's actually achieving the best possible return for taxpayers, which many people would tell you it is not, but it also highlights how NAMA and the state's complicity in creating these kind of more direct connections between global finance and, and, the, and the property market. I'll skip through the rest fairly quickly because I'd say I'm getting close to time here. Um, the REITs have also benefited their investors by jacking up the rents on these properties very, very quickly. Um, the REIT rules for, for the REITs have increased by about 50 to 75% since IPO. And while this has been driven by you know, their expanding portfolio as they acquire more assets, it's also been driven by them jacking up the rents at the individual uh, property buildings. This graph down here is for Hibernia REIT and shows its planned rent reversions at a number of its uh, city centre buildings over the next two years. You're talking rental increases planned of anywhere between 30 and 69% on these buildings, which again, okay, these are commercial buildings, but uh, they're, they're having a massive impact. Um, an average apartment in Inchicore in the west of the city where IRES invests is probably about 1,250 euro. An IRES building in the, in the picture I just showed you on the previous slide, uh, this one here, that's about 1,700 euro. 
So they're actively targeting more middle and higher income households, pushing out lower income households out of this traditionally working class neighborhood. Actually, it's the neighborhood Declan, Declan actually lives in. Um, so they're, 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 they're contributing to these kind of economic evictions and also which in themselves are leading to a homelessness crisis. And in Dublin at the minute, we actually have a very serious homelessness crisis. About 7,500 homeless people every night in the city using emergency homeless shelters, about 2,500 of them children. So again, the REITs are, are, are redistributing these, these, these kind of rental dividends by jacking up these REITs back to their investors. I'll skip over this slide just to say that the REITs are increasingly getting into the development side. Of, of the game as they try to find new ways to basically sweat the assets to the greatest extent that they have. And again, th these, this will be justification for driving up uh, rental growth, as well as uh, an opportunity for replacing less profitable tenants with kind of more blue chip tenants. Just in terms of achievements, uh, so over 2016, I've kind of finished out um, a range of publications from a couple of previous um, but related kind of projects. So I've delivered about five articles over 2016 for, for a number of high impact journals. I've expanded my reach net, um, research network dramatically, obviously being involved with Manuel Albers Real Estate Financial Complex Group in Leuven, but also uh, the Contested Cities Group, uh, particularly Mikhail Janoska and uh, Georgia Alexandri out of, out of Madrid, and we're working on a few bits and pieces together. I'm um, also uh, obviously been uh, kind of with a, a kind of couple of uh, conference publications outputs again from Contested Cities in Madrid last year, but I'm also involved in RC43 and RC21 this year, this summer, uh, and I've, uh, I've been awarded some small kind of research dissemination money to kind of supplement my urban studies uh, funding to, to, to help with that. Importantly, myself and Declan have established a very productive, uh, um, we see it as a strategic relationship with Dublin City Council's housing department uh, and their new kind of housing research office. Uh, and we're doing a, a, a lot of analysis on their um, very large scale databases on the, the homelessness uh, and emergency shelter use, which is kind of supplementing uh, some of the work that I've been doing through this fellowship. Most importantly, uh, I've recently been appointed a uh, full-time lecturer in Housing and Re Urban Regeneration at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, and this is a post that I'll be taking up in July of this year. So uh, my, my involvement as a fellow will, 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 will end in June, but obviously I, I'm very keen to stay kind of as part of the network and I will obviously be looking to produce um, further materials from, from the work that I've done thus far. So my immediate aims for the next you know, kind of month and a half are to complete out some of the remaining interviews that I'm, that I'm going to do. I literally start that again when I, when I go back to Dublin tomorrow, uh, and obviously work on some of this kind of DCC, Dublin City Council data that we have. Uh, in terms of publications, I have an article on REITs. I've just given you the kind of the very brief kind of overview. That article is pretty much ready to go, and I'm either geoform or, or urban geography still to be decided. Myself and Declan are working on a submission to a, a special issue for international planning studies on kind of post-crisis planning reforms at the minute. While I have two further planned articles that look more in depth at the lobbying activities of the Irish REITs Forum that I mentioned earlier, as well as a, kind of a, the, 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 the reshaping of Irish planning policy post-crash under a financialized discourse of, of commercial viability. Um, and like I said, I'm involved in uh, both RC43 and RC21 this summer as well. So thanks very much.